We all rely on farmers and ranchers, but farming is riskier than other businesses out there. Crop insurance helps farmers manage their risk. With crop insurance, farmers put skin in the game by paying premiums and shouldering deductibles. That keeps taxpayers from having to pick up the whole bill every time disaster strikes. Today, about 90% of U.S. farmland is insured, providing $100 billion in protection to more than 130 different kinds of crops. It's a testament to the program's success. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Meet the Lawmaker. I'm Ben Nully, joined by freshman Congresswoman Kat Kamick of Florida's 3rd Congressional District. Congresswoman, welcome to the program. First, you grew up on a cattle ranch and have also served as Deputy Chief of Staff for the district you're serving now. Uh, but ultimately, what caused you to run for office? Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you for having me on. And yes, I actually got involved in politics because of a failure of big government that resulted in my family losing our small cattle ranch. And it was April of 2011. We had found out that there was a housing program that none of us had ever signed up for, but there had been legislation in Washington passed that essentially incentivized big banks that had mortgage portfolios to um, encourage people to get refinanced on their loans, uh, to lower the rate or the, the, the mortgage payment. And this was right after the housing bubble, you know, we were in the great recession. And so a lot of people, millions of Americans were refinancing their loans. But what had happened was in the legislation, it incentivized big banks to do this. And if they couldn't save the loan, and I couldn't save the loan, um, they got a tax credit. So banks figured out very quickly that they could make a lot of money by basically pushing people into these loans and then losing the loan at the end. And that was really frustrating because no one signed up for this program. And my family, along with about 7 million other people across the country, lost their homes as a direct result of this bad legislation that had been tucked into an 1800 page bill that really no one had bothered to read. And it was at that moment that my whole life kind of changed. You know, you find yourself homeless and you have lost everything that your family has worked for and everything you've ever known. And at that point, I was graduating college. I was looking to get involved in the oil and gas industry. And instead, I took a job on the other side of the country in Florida, uh, working as a campaign manager for a guy who was looking to take on big government. And that's how I got involved because I was so fed up and so frustrated and knew that if people didn't stand up, every single working class family was going to be affected one way or the other by this growing size of government. And we've seen it time and time again. So that's really been the driving force for me getting involved. But um, more recently, uh, my husband and I, we've been talking about starting a family. And when it came time to make the decision to run or not run, we ultimately decided that we would not be raising our babies in a socialist nation where our kids wouldn't have the same opportunities that we had. So that's what we're fighting for really is not just the now, but the future. And that's why we're here and working hard to make sure that we do that every single day. Tell me about the makeup of your district. If I understand it, it's around uh, covers most of Gainesville and then goes up to Jacksonville and kind of that central portion of Florida, but what type of ag um, I guess, what type of ag practices are in that district and, and some of those things you're focused on? So I, I like to say that our district is the best district in the state of Florida. I'm sure every member says that, but you know, the fight in third, we're pretty dang good. Um, so we are home to the Gator Nation. So University of Florida, uh, Land Grant University, and of course, the incredible IFAS research and development work that we've done in agriculture. But as far as production in our district, you're right. We do start up in the suburbs of Jacksonville, Clay County, which isn't necessarily known for agriculture, but we do have a, quite a bit of agriculture up there, whether it is uh, cattle or um, actually sweet corn down to Putnam County where we have potatoes and ferns, something that people really aren't familiar with, but we have quite the fern industry in uh, Putnam County in that region. And then when you come down a little bit further south into Ocala, that's horse country. 
And we are the horse capital of the world, often mistaken for Kentucky, but we actually are the breeders and trainers of some of the finest Kentucky Derby winners that uh, history has seen. In fact, just this year, the Kentucky Derby winner was bred and trained in Ocala. So we're really proud of our equine industry in Marion County. But then you look in to our uh, Union, Bradford, Alachua County area, we have peanuts, watermelons, uh, sweet corn, timber, dairy. Um, you know, we have just such a diverse industry uh, when it comes to agriculture and the different commodities that are produced here. I'm really proud to represent such a diverse group of producers and really um, a community that is focused on building up that next generation that feeds America and the world. You talk about having a diverse um kind of district in terms of agriculture, being the lone Florida Republican on the House Agriculture Committee, I guess, what are some of the main priorities you hope to accomplish on that committee, as well as working with your fellow lawmakers there? Oh, how, how much time do we have? Uh, just a few minutes, but uh, <laughs> if you can be as brief as possible. Okay. Uh, well, yes. So as the lone Republican on agriculture for the entire state of Florida, I kind of find myself dual hatting as a conservative commissioner of agriculture across the state, because Florida, of course, as we know, is very diverse in terms of our production. You know, down south, we have everything from squash to orchids, of course, a tremendous amount of uh, timber production, sugar, you name it, we have got it in Florida. And it's one of our top drivers of the economy, if not number one, most years. So one of my big issues is really incentivizing uh, programs to one, buy domestic production. Florida has a unique situation where we have similar harvest seasons um, between Mexico and Central America. So we typically find ourselves getting hurt by some of the unfair uh, trade practices. So whether it is seasonal or perishable provisions that need to be included in this latest uh, iteration of USMCA, that's something that we're fighting for, particularly with blueberries. We've seen that um, be really, that industry really be hurt by the fact that we have a lot of dumping going on in our markets and COVID highlighted that for us. Another big issue for us is labor. I for so long have been working on an H2A fix, um, but beyond that, moving the issue of labor through our agriculture industry from DUL to USDA. I think that USDA is much better suited to understand the challenges when it comes to labor. And of course, being in Florida, H2A isn't always viable for us because we have year round industries. As we all know, H2A is only good for 10 months. And so really updating, streamlining, modernizing, uh, modernizing this program but taking a common sense approach to immigration reform as it relates to migrant labor for our domestic industries here, dealing with both the domestic population here, but a pre-vetted pool um, that is driven by industry rather than a government mandate is what we're seeking to do. And then, of course, just finding long-term certainty with the tax code. A lot of our producers are trying to pass on a family operation, but we all in, in agriculture know the saying, you know, land rich, cash poor. And depending on um, the year or the administration that you find yourself with a family tragedy or a family situation that's trying to um, pass that on to the next generation, it could be very costly or in some cases just set up so that we have we have to sell the family farm. So it's tax issues, it's regulatory issues. You know, Waters of the U.S. has a tremendous impact on our producers. That's something that we're watching very closely. And, and I think when it comes down to it, I ultimately would love to see agriculture being included as part of the conversation for why agriculture is driving conservation and true environmental protection. For so long, we've been on the receiving end of the nasty attacks and being accused of being bad stewards of the environment. That couldn't be further from the truth. So I think it's time we start really taking an active role in driving that narrative. I know that that's a lot that I just threw at you, but when it comes down to it, it's regs, it's taxes, it's conservation, it's labor issues. And at the end of the day, we have to recognize that agriculture is national security. A nation that cannot feed itself is not secure. So I, I find my two positions on house ag and on homeland security to find a, I find a nice nexus there where we're able to talk about agriculture in a way that is related to national security. Right now, it seems like uh, Congress can be more divided than it has been in the past. How do you yes. get something like the immigration issue um, across the finish line into President Biden's desk, ultimately, when you have both sides 
of Congress kind of fighting with each other on this issue? Well, uh, first, I think we need to stop the, the notion that every answer is a broad brush, one size fits all. You know, I shudder when someone says comprehensive because we've tried comprehensive healthcare reform. We've tried comprehensive immigration reform. Comprehensive is just really a recipe for disaster where everybody's losing and there's really no fix and everybody wants to, you know, pick up their ball and, and run away from the playground because their feelings got hurt. We need to take this one issue at a time. First and foremost, you know, the border situation is often uh, conflated with immigration. Right now, the border situation is a national security concern and humanitarian crisis. So we need to deal with that on a separate issue. When it comes to the immigration reform, we need to take it bit by bit. We need to talk about um, the high skilled uh, workers. We need to talk about uh, how do we address the domestic population here. We need to look at the impacts that um, E-Verify would have if we were to do it for one industry versus another. I like to think that we could run a pilot program through ag that would be the model moving forward for construction and hospitality. Instead of trying to do a one-size-fits-all approach that government loves to do, I think we should take it a little bit more granular and approach these issues where Republicans and Democrats can come together and say, yes, this is a problem. This is a broken issue. And we're going to focus narrowly on this one issue and not let the other issues conflate what's going on. That, I think, is how we can move the needle forward a little bit, because all we've seen is poison pills being inserted into all these big, massive packages. And that's where the failure of government really um, is highlighted, because we fail to fix certain issues that the American people deserve answers and, and solutions to. So I would love to see government take on the issue of single issue bills and really tackle these items bit by bit. That way we can actually fix them long-term rather than putting band-aids on them. Uh, switching gears here, tell me what it's like being the youngest Republican woman in Congress right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I, I served this area as the deputy chief of staff previously. So um, I kind of came into this with a servant's mindset for sure. And of course, my husband, he's a public servant as well. He's a firefighter, SWAT medic. Um, so our, our go to, you know, our MO is always to be a helper. And I find myself as the youngest Republican woman helping some of my older colleagues on a variety of issues, whether it be, hey, here's how um, you can better serve your constituents with federal agencies all the way down to how do I turn on my computer and how do I adjust the settings on my iPhone? Um, I think, I, I think that sometimes, you know, as a young person, we get tasked with, uh, or, or asked to help out with issues that um, typically wouldn't be asked of colleagues, but it's it's all in good spirit. And I, I'm happy to build those relationships with my colleagues from the perspective of a millennial, because at the end of the day, millennials and Gen Zs were the largest voting bloc in America. Um, the decisions that are being made today are impacting our generation more so than any other. And I tell people all the time for, for our, a long time we have had discussions or I've heard the discussions of how do we how do we really build up um, a country for that next generation that would be proud to pass on and what do they want how do you talk to millennials and now for the first time I've been able to raise my hand and say well millennials are in the room so let's have a conversation and I think that's really really important that we now have uh, the full breadth of the United States in terms of of adults in in the room now. Congresswoman, I know uh, just last question here, wrapping up, uh, you mentioned the luxury of time. Is there anything you like to do in your free time away from Congress to kind of take your mind off? Seems like all the chaos happening in DC, but anything on that front? Well, I have yet to find really a day off, um, but if I ever do find one, uh, maybe on a Sunday or something, you would find me out fishing with my husband. Um, my, my passion is fishing. I love being out on the water. Um, I was president of the bass fishing club in college, and it's, it's really my happy place of just being out there and having that weight off your shoulders and hopefully find yourself with no self-service because then no one can call you. Um, so that would be what I would say is if I could be, if I could be uh, out on the water fishing, that would be great. And if that's not the case, the moments that I have at home, hanging out with chickens and ducks and cleaning a, out the coop and working, that's, that's also a pretty good day for me. Well, Congresswoman, thanks for your time today. Hey, thank you, Ben. Appreciate it.